Uh, our session today is going to be focused on electrification, uh, which uh, is absolutely paramount uh, and it's at the top of mind for everybody within the industry. And uh, the unique part of this is that uh, my guests and I, we're going to be talking through kind of high level considerations, but we're using intelligence to drive that. So uh, Peter Kahn, who's senior director of our research and insights team, Peter, thank you for, for the virtual wave. Uh, his team has fielded an immense amount of research uh, that ultimately has driven the outputs, the intelligence, and that's what we're going to be walking you through today. Um, so without further ado, uh, again, uh, Peter Kahn, Senior Director of Research and Insights at CDK Global. Uh, I am Ryan Hovey, uh, Director of our OEM Marketing with CDK Global. So when we think of electrification and we think of it in the automotive industry and all of the peripheral and kind of collateral effects that electrification has, uh, again, we have this unique perspective uh, as a technology provider and as a technology partner to the automotive industry that we have an opportunity to work with OEMs, dealer networks, and ultimately have a line of sight uh, to the end consumer. And I think that it's really important when you think of all of those moving pieces of what the industry is and how we operate and how we can help uh, the OEM, how we can help a dealer network, it's ultimately using the consumer as our North Star and knowing that we need to follow his or her journey and we need to make every point along that journey the best that it can be. There's so many things that are happening right now. And when I say deciphering the buzz, there's an immense amount of buzz that's happening. Uh, when you look at supply chain issues that have absolutely been compounded or amplified by uh, the pandemic. And we're uh, on the back end of that right now. And uh, you still see at dealer lots and with OEMs from a vehicle production perspective, that there are still constraints that are there. Uh, and you look at dealership operations and how dealers are operating right now is much different than how they were operating three years ago with the inventory that they do have available, with how vehicles are being purchased, with how vehicles are being shopped for, it is different than it's ever been. And a really, really exciting thing, and I think this has been something that's been said multiple times, is we are going to see more change in the automotive industry in the next five years than we've seen in the last 50 years. And there is no better place to be than right here. Our CDK team has access and insights across the entire customer journey. We are partnered at the hip with our OEM partners. We are partnered with the entire dealer network for any given OEM. Uh, and it gives us a really, really special stance and, and it makes really exciting work for our entire team. And there's the realities of today. It's really focused on how can OEMs better partner with their dealers? How can they work together to make the end customer journey even better than it is given the supply constraints, the inventory constraints that there are, the electrification that is hanging in the background. And we see that electrification is starting to become uh, not mainstream by any means, but it will continue to gain steam. And I think that the outputs, again, of Peter Kahn and his team, the research that they've done uh, from an EV shopper survey, uh, that's what we're going to walk through today. And I think that those outputs and ultimately the action uh, and kind of the suggestions of like, here's some things that you can do as an OEM, here's some things that you can do as a dealer, uh, will will help inspire change uh, through every step of the network. Before we get to all of that, as I sort of mentioned, I kind of wanted to plant the seed that we are focused on her, the end customer, knowing that we want to do everything that we can to ensure that her journey is the best that it can be. So whether she's shopping for a vehicle, buying a vehicle, or owning a vehicle, we need to do everything we can as an OEM, as a dealer network, as an ISV, and as a technology partner, we have to do everything in our power to make her journey the best that it can be, shopping, buying, and owning. It's a cyclical journey. The shopping experience has to be amazing to ultimately have somebody that wants to transact and purchase a vehicle. That purchase needs to be a really awesome experience that leads to an after sales journey or an ownership journey. And that ownership is a really, really important. Probably the most significant piece is that that piece of this customer journey has to be awesome. 
because that leads to brand loyalty. It leads to dealership loyalty. And ultimately it leads to a repurchase of the next vehicle. As somebody graduates from one life stage to the next life stage to the next, the goal is not only do they come back and buy the same brand of vehicle, but that they come back to the same dealership and they can work with the same team that they worked with in the past. This journey now covers digital and physical. You have brick and mortar dealerships, but you have all of these digital ecosystems. Our goal is to create an omni-channel experience that ultimately helps meet and exceed those consumer expectations across social media, tier one websites, contact centers from a dealership, the actual dealer itself, the dealership itself, as well as mobile and digital, uh, that all of that has to be this really cohesive experience across the digital and physical environments. I'm not gonna walk through all of the stats here. There's some really amazing things, but it's really showcasing the fact that people absolutely are looking to start journeys online and then from where they go, from that initial shopping experience and how they interact with a brand, how they meet a brand, that they ultimately, 86% are starting that online. Another really, really awesome fact here, 72% of those folks, they want to finalize the dealer, the dealer, the deal in a dealership. So they want to be face-to-face -face with somebody. They want to have a brick and mortar, a physical location to go to. Uh, and, and that's really, really important that, again, no matter how they start the journey, that seven out of 10 folks want to finish that face-to-face -face in a dealership. It shows the power of a dealer network. It shows the power of a dealership and how a dealer is embedded in its local community and the importance of a dealer within a local community. And then the last one I want to talk about is as we begin to look at the next generation of purchasers, the next generation that will be transacting of vehicles and have purchasing power, Gen Z, nearly 70% of them are saying, I want to have face-to-face -face interaction. That there has been the stereotypes or the generalizations that Gen Z is a digital generation and that they only want to focus on digital. The research and the outputs that we're seeing is that they want to have those face-to-face -face interactions. They want to be a part of a brand. They want to feel a brand. They want to know what a brand stands for. They want the same thing for their dealerships as well. They want to know what a dealership stands for. They want to know how a dealer is embedded in its community and how it is helping the local community. That they are an experiential generation, not just a digital generation. I think that's a really important key as a part of all of this. So how we're going to walk through this presentation is using this construct that you see on the screen, shopping, buying, and owning. And we're going to go step by step Peter's going to walk through all of the intelligence that his team has gathered through uh, months and months of surveys that they have admit, administered out in the field. And, and Peter's going to walk you through that methodology. But again, it's it's been really, really amazing to see all of the work that his team has generated. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Khan. Ryan, thank you for that fantastic and warm welcome. And I certainly want to say thank you to all that are attending this breakout session and attending CDK Connect Live. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, the research that we did. And we did this research um, in two waves um, and very fo much focused on the EV buyer in the first wave and the EV owner. We did that work late January. And then we came back and did some additional research um, I want to say in late April, we wanted to understand a little bit more about the ownership experience and how that could affect your fixed operations business. Um, and I'm going to bring in some of the other research that we do aside from BEV to help kind of accentuate some of the trends that we see, um, be it the service shopper, what's going on in the service side of the business, what's it like to buy a new car, um, what's it like for you all as far as de dealing with the challenges. So I'll bring all that in as well. Uh, I would say that this is going to be a fast flyby on some of the data that we got out of our EV studies that I just mentioned. Um, if you want to know more after this presentation, we've got what I think is a great white paper on CDK Global uh, electrification. So there's more data there. Now, it's interesting when I started working on this presentation, again, going back to when we did our first study back in late January, early February, there's been so much change since then. I mean, if you think about it, gas prices going up. Um, material supply shortages getting even more critical. The introduction of a lot of 
EV models coming out of the different manufacturers and particularly in the sweet spot of where customers buy vehicles. You know, there's a saying that America is a truck and SUV uh, uh, country with passenger cars, with sedans kind of filling in the gaps. And so, you know, that's what we're starting to see now from coming from the OEMs um, and then both government mandates as well as government incentives. You know, all of this has happened since the time we do the research. Uh, that, that does not denigrate the numbers I'm going to show you because the major trends are there. The only point of that is things are happening fast. There's an acceleration in this area. Uh, and we're also seeing a lot more shopper interest in, in the owning an electric vehicle. So we're going to go back out again, bring some more information to you all and help guide you through the thicket and get you all prepared for how you transition to an EV future. So let's talk a little bit about the survey that we did. We looked again at three, at a couple different groups. One is EV intenders. They're thinking about buying an EV. They may or may not buy one. The next group is they've bought some type of vehicle. So they may have bought a BEV, they may have bought a hybrid, they may have bought gas. And then again, I mentioned that we went back and we got a, an ownership view. Um, some of the metrics that we use to really understand a little bit more about how these folk, what these folks are thinking about um, is we call them beacon metrics. Are they likely to recommend the vehicle or, or the experience to other folks they know? And we know that 43% of folks who are interested in buying a car really depend on their family and friends for recommendations. So that idea of recommending is really important. Um, I'm going to be using something that may uh, some of you folks may know, some of you folks may not. It's called a net promoter score. It measures, again, it's a kind of a customer sat thing, and it's how likely would somebody recommend to their friends. Uh, essentially, those folks that would recommend, we count those folks up, and then we subtract those folks who would not recommend. And out of that comes this net promoter score. So I'll be using that. Um, it can go anywhere from where nobody recommends, that's a minus 100, to everybody recommends, which would be a plus 100. Um, and then that, what actually comes out is somewhere in between a zero is, again, kind of well, not so great. But, you know, when you get into the 20s, 30s, 40s, that's a pretty good score. When we get up in the 60s and 70s, that's a fantastic score. So I'll be using that to talk about how shoppers are feeling about, you know, either buying an electric vehicle or their experience at the dealership or the actual ownership of the vehicle. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about who we surveyed. You know, we have a wide range of folks. You know, they'd be equal on gender, um, a wide range of income age, education, um, what kind of vehicle they currently drive and what their body style is, how what type of what kind of car owner are they? Are they a sports car enthusiast? Are they a, you know, essentially they need a car for a work vehicle. So we have all that information we're going to bring in as well. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide and just start talking about our buyers. All right. So interestingly enough, um, and these are folks that are saying, I, I am interested in buying an EV. I, I could consider it. 91% of the folks who said that in our survey said that if they do buy an EV, it would be their primary vehicle. Um, now, interestingly enough also is that they're not, most of them are not solely dependent on having an EV. They're also thinking about those long trips, kind of a backup car, a safety car. So if you think about how this plays out from a in kind of a psychological thing, folks are thinking about, you know, I need something that's low cost that get me around to do my errands. Um, this more fits in a suburban environment, not so much urban because it's hard to find it. Charging is a hard thing to get. Um, so it fits really well in suburban where people are driving 15, 20, 25 miles to do the errands, take the kids to school, what have you. But if they need to take a long trip, they're thinking about, again, where am I going to charge? Um, how far is this EV going to take me? If I want to tow a boat, how's that going to work out? So again, there's most folks are saying, I'm going to keep a gas car around, at least for now. Of course, that may change as we get as we deal with some of the concerns about range, and we have more of an infrastructure with charging and fast chargers. That that secondary car may go away. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of folks that are excited about the EV, but also you know what's keeping them from from buying an EV. And you know, the, uh, first before we get into the 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 data, I want to talk a little bit about some emotional reasons on why they may hesitate. Because emotional reasons, you know, at the end of the day, that re is really what people go by, you know, their gut feel, so to speak. So what are the emotional reasons, these 46% of folks saying, I'm never going to buy an EV, or I don't see it in my future. Um, the way we get that, by the way, is we do a lot of interviews. And so there were a couple of themes that came up. One was, and it's, uh, it, it's really a great theme, and that is I'll encapsulated into, I like the rumble of the car. I just like that 
emotional feeling that a gas car gives me. That's something I've grown up with. And it's, it's just something I can't l- leave behind. You know, the, you could say the, the EV, which a lot of folks who drive an EV really like the, you know, the feeling of that, but it's a more sterile environment. The car is very quiet. So if you like the rumble, then, you know, you're going to be ga- driving gas for a while. Another reason could be, I just like to tinker on, on cars. I know how to repair them. I want to do my own service. I want to go down to the parts store, buy some stuff and fix it. I want control over how uh, the vehicle I own. So that could be another reason. Again, emotional reason why somebody is going to stick with gas. And then the third reason, which is starting to come up now in our interviews, uh, and this is all again, very recent, is there are some folks that say, yeah, I don't really, I'm not really excited about the idea of go- the government mandating what I'm going to buy, um, you know, and that's a concern for all of us in the industry, I, you know, for, for the dealers and for the OEMs in the room, but particularly for the dealers, I would say that, you know, when, when you greet customers and if you feel that they are an EV intender, make sure that, you know, you mirror their enthusiasm about how great the car is and, you know, try not to bring any of the personal politics you may have into the conversation. People are excited about buying a car. And in the most cases right now, um, it's a fairly expensive purchase. So, you know, you want, you want to make sure that, again, you don't blunt any kind of emotional reasons why they could stay away from it. Um, just a little bit about who is either thinking about an EV or not thinking about an EV by generation. Um, the boomer is interesting enough, and this goes back to this rumble of the car, or I want to fix the car myself. Boomers had the highest rate of resistance to EVs at this point in time. Um, but there's also a, a fair percentage that are also thinking about going to electric. Um, Gen Z actually had a fairly high rate, the second highest rate of transition to the to an EV. Um, young millennials actually had the highest uh, interest in the EV. So that younger generation is interested more in going toward an EV. Um, all right, so let's go to the next slide. Talk a little bit more about some of those quantitative reasons on what's holding people back. Next slide. So I think you know everybody who's kept any watch on you know, what are the reasons why people don't want to buy? You know, these are very familiar terms. These are the, this is the data that we saw. Um, charge it, it takes uh, charging is a lot longer than it takes for just filling up the gas tank. Of course, you know we have to get fast chargers out there. The lack of charging networks, um, and then the limited range of EVs. So these are all things that are keeping people from saying, "Yeah, I'm going to pull the pin and I'm going to buy an EV." It does go back potentially to that idea of having that secondary car. Now. When we surveyed these folks, you know, they get, we gave them an ch- opportunity to talk about multiple reasons why they wouldn't buy. And it really revolves around infrastructure uh, and, ba- and, and the, the distance the battery can take somebody. When we asked them what the single biggest concern was of these, uh, limited driving range w- and lack of charging networks were the biggest reasons why people weren't um, interested in getting an EV. Now, it turns out, for younger generations, this last bullet here, this limited living, excuse me, living in an apartment. Um, interestingly enough, you know, if you own a home, it's pretty easy to get your car charged up. In fact, it's actually a benefit of owning an EV. You wake up every morning for a full tank of gas. You live in an apartment. Uh, that's just not going to be the case in a lot of situations where there isn't a charging point in your apartment. And so, the younger folks who may not, you know, yet able to afford a house. You know, that's a big concern for them. So if we've got younger people who are more likely to be interested in an EV for various reasons, but at the same time, they're limited in where they can get their vehicle charged conveniently, that's going to be a depressor for those folks buying into the market. And let's look at that a little bit more. Next slide, please. So again, breaking down by generations, um, when we asked folks who ended up buying a gas car, you know, what were some of the reasons why you did buy a gas car? And as we go down through that generational change, um, you can see boomers at 12%, they, that was a reason they didn't have their own garage. But as the generations get younger, 16% for Gen X, 23% millennials, again, that home ownership is a big factor here. Owning the garage, being able to get service out to the garage and be able to charge up that car, um, that's important. And again, for the dealers in the room, you know, we are going to talk a little bit about additional service offerings that you may want to think about and the idea of partnering with your, your utility companies and p- potentially offering a package, maybe through some local electrical contractors that you worked out something with, but offering a package through F&I and selling a whole service that brings um, a home charging system to people's homes could be another way to replace the revenue streams that you may are you may be concerned about, you know, with that transition and maintenance from the typical oil change or what have you into 
you know, an EV uh, service. So there's ways of bringing in revenue back into the dealership. And that's one of the ways you could do this. Um, next slide, please. All right. So interestingly enough, and I'm going to get a little theoretical and academic, what have you, and this has to do with what um, folks call, and this is kind of a marketing term, the product adoption curve. So, and, and this kind of happens in all types of technologies, which you typically have when somebody introduces new technologies, you have what is called early adopters or innovators, folks that are, you know, willing to just try something. They're, they're kind of just excited by something new. Um, and there's folks along with those, that group that are, I would call them visionaries. That's a good way to describe them. You know, they can see the future and they want to get into it now. Um, now, the, as we change and as that technology becomes more easy to obtain and people start to learn about it and get excited about it, the whole dynamic shifts. And now you have practical buyers coming in and they're not thinking so much about the cool new features. They're thinking more about, is this practical for my needs? And that's where money matters and really does matter a lot. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the early buyers, you know, those owners that we surveyed. But in this case, what we're now starting to see is what I consider a sea change in attitude. And I think with the introduction by the manufacturers of a lot of models, particularly, again, in that truck range, that SUV range, um, as they overcome some of the supply shortages and material shortages to make batteries um, easier to get, less expensive, money matters and money matters a lot. And it matters to our shoppers as well. Again, we're in that kind of funny transitional stage. Some of the vehicles coming out are very expensive. The luxury uh, manufacturers do have expensive cars, but there's also manufacturers that are coming out, you know, again, in the mass market areas, such as Kia or Hyundai that have reasonably priced cars. And of course, of course Chevy has, you know, what we consider a, you know, a, a very attainable vehicle for folks that typically go out and buy any type of new car. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So money matters. And again, that was a major reason for folks that were thinking about, it, about buying an EV is to save money. Where do they save money? We've talked about that. You know, they get that full tank of gas and they, you know, other than the electric bill, they're not paying anything and they have the comfort of always being, not having to worry about getting to the gas station. Um, and then there's that idea of maintenance savings as well. So we found that again in our survey. That's a really, really great way to kind of put a bow on shopping. And, and again, I think that there's so many variables as a part of that shopping experience. And, and now uh, we're going to have an opportunity again to, as a part of that customer journey and using that shop by own construct. We'll really talk about uh, the buying and, and ultimately when you start to look at the transaction and what does that mean and how do we transact and who is transacting, uh, that shifts us into who is the EV buyer. So these are the folks that bought an EV. Um, and it's an interesting demographic if we look through this. Um, most of them are have a four-year college degree. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this the EV has kind of resonated with the younger buyer. Um, and you can put them again, maybe in a little bit of a visionary category. So 75% are under 45. Um, boomers are still liking that rumble, still liking, you know, the idea of the gas car they've grown up with. Um, interesting enough, these are fairly young folks, but they're making pretty good money. So over $100,000 and then everybody's working. So this is the demographic of what we've seen. Again, I've, I'm bringing up this idea is that this demographic will change and get to be a much wider range when we go back out and survey again shortly. Next slide. So again, I'm talking about folks that own a, a BEV. Um, what were the motivators that led them to buy a BEV? And when, again, thinking about you know, in the dealership, as folks come in the door, you know, you really want to understand what the motivators are. And so when you ask those important penetrating questions, you can start to position, you know, the shopper in front of you, should I show the, should I introduce them to the EV first? You know, let's get a, a sense of who they are. Um, I wouldn't necessarily use this graph as the all encompassing guide to determining whether or not you're going to try and put them in an EV, but I think it's important to see this data. And that number one, interestingly enough, is the advanced technology that it comes with BEVs, not only the power plant itself, but all the cool features that come around an EV, you know, over the air updates, um, some of the connected vehicle features, um, just it's cool, it's new. And to be quite honest, some people just wanna be the coolest kid on the block and have the newest, the, the newest ride, so to speak. So advanced technology was the number one reason, interestingly enough. Um, but right behind that, of course, is that reduced impact on the environment. And then the third reason is cost effective. Again, I really think that, you know, going back to that product adoption curve I mentioned earlier, 
that this is going to change and you're going to see the cost effectiveness start to bubble up. Advanced technology is going to matter, but you know, these top three reasons are going to move around. And I actually would say vehicle performance matters as well. That's something is, by the way, is something that people experience when they test drive that car. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, next slide, please. All right. So, um, and Ryan mentioned this, that, you know, the, the dealership is really at the heart of this, uh, of this journey. And I have to say, I'm going to step back and talk about some other data that we bring in. Um, we're running, a, and I think it was mentioned in the, in the main session, we're running a, what we call a monthly uh, new vehicle shopper index. And so we asked people who bought a vehicle in the last three months, um, how easy was it to buy your, your new car? And it turns out that 83% right now are saying it was easy. And in fact, 67% are saying it was easier than the last time I bought a car. They're going to the dealership. Um, they're finding the dealership really, you guys have done a great job. I've got to say, uh, we did another study where we actually got um, 40, a net promoter. I mentioned, I was going to say that, talk about that. A 45%, a plus 45% saying, hey, the, I really thought this was a great experience uh, going to the dealership. There were a few friction points there, but for the most part, you know, you guys are delivering, um, you're making it work. Um, most folks are, you know, they don't see necessarily they're going to buy direct from the manufacturer. And interestingly enough, to make sure you understand this data, we've got about 50% Tesla sample in this. So it's about 50% Tesla owners, about 50% non-Tesla owners. And so even with that Tesla model, most folks, again, are thinking dealer. When we just look at the non-Tesla customers, that number of going to the dealerships a lot higher. And let's take a look at that, that shopper journey. Next slide, please. All right. So how are people buying their car? Um, and we're going to go from top to bottom. So first of all, the notion of doing completely online, which, you know, had been, has been trotted up in the past. You know, people are just going to do click to buy. Um, we at CDK do not believe that. You know, Brian McDonald made a very strong statement about we believe that the dealership is at the heart of the of the transaction. Um, there's a lot of really great reasons for that. You know, it's the idea of the experience. It's the idea of building the relationship. Um, folks that we talk to, folks that we survey, don't like the idea that if they want to ask about something about their new vehicle or if they need some help with it, they don't want to call an 800 number. They want to be able to talk to somebody that they met. Um, they formed that relationship. That's why the dealership really matters. And again, forming the relationship, being the product expert, being there to help them with their needs. So only 6% said, hey, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go online. And again, we have Tesla folks in this mix. 12%, um, interesting enough, started at the dealership, ended at the dealership. So twice as many um, as the folks that said bought online. But if you look at this, most folks are dealing in some way between online and dealership. So 15% started online, went to the dealership, finished online, but 67% started online, went to the dealership, and then finished at the dealership. So an overwhelming percent of folks going to the dealership at some point. And this is the omni-channel data that we're seeing. And so if you haven't, if you're not really doing this yet or not thinking about it, I can't stress enough how important it is to really invest in omni-channel. And as was said at the main breakout session, um, really leaning into omni-channel and being there at the right point in the journey where the shopper wants to either interact with you online or come to the dealership and experience something the dealership can bring unique to them. What would, would be one of those unique things? Let's go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I'm going to talk a little bit about breakout of these generations first. I just There's one point I think it's really important here that I want to make sure you guys understand. Um, and this is a generational cut of where they plan to buy their vehicle. Uh, and you can see, again, and I'm a boomer, I'll, I'll admit it, I'll own my age. Um, <laughs> you know, folks of my age and Gen X and to some extent older millennials, you know, we've, we've been here, we've done that, so to speak. We've been to the dealership, we know what to expect. Um, and so we're very comfortable going to the going to the dealership and, and transacting there. Uh, Gen Z, a little more hesitant, but I think um, it's been mentioned before and I'll mention it again. Um, and it's coming from our data as well as other studies that we look at is that while Gen Z initially thinks about this, uh, about the online experience, because they're comfortable with that, at the same time, they also want an experience and they want to really talk to a product expert and they really want to you know, understand exactly what they're buying. This is their first transaction a lot of times. So they need to know all the things about what it is I'm getting myself into. So while we see, again, in our survey, 45% of the Gen Z shoppers say, yeah, I'm, I'll go to the dealership, but 34% 
are saying, ah, you know, I may go to a third party retailer. I may do this another way. We believe that when they when they actually go to the dealership and again, experience the relationship, the product expertise, um, that number is going to change. So this is something that, you know, we're, we're, we believe this will shift. Next slide, please. All right. So why do people go to the dealerships? There's a lot of reasons, but, you know, overall, 83% are saying, you know, the test drive was really important to them buying an EV. You know, I, I heard of data coming from uh, another research firm, J.D. Power, who said that um, 3X, they have a data that says 3X um, of folks who get in an EV will buy it, and 4X of those folks who drive the car will buy it. And, you know, honestly, it's a great experience to drive an EV. Um, it's quiet. Uh, it's, you know, the performance is fantastic. If you are kind of a muscle car person, it, you know, you're going to have amazing performance in this car. You have a lot more room because the packaging is different. The drivetrain is different. Um, there's a lot of good things about the EV. And in fact, going back to that net promoter um, that I mentioned earlier, we get a over 60 plus net promoter from non-Tesla buyers. And we get a 67% of Tesla buyers. We compare that to 45 for ICE drivers. So let me just make sure I, I am clear on what I'm saying here. I mentioned that net promoter, the higher the number, the more likely you're gonna recommend the car to somebody else, your friends or colleagues. So getting closer to 100 means there's a much more, people are much more positive and that anything above 60 was a fantastic net promoter score. That's what we're seeing from EV owners. We're seeing a much lower score from ICE owners. It's They like it. You know, they like their ride, they've spent money on it, but it's not near as strong and it's not near as it, there's not near the enthusiasm as it, there is with EV buyers. So just thinking about that, again, people come to your dealership, um, if it seems like they're interested, they, they express an interest in EVs, I can, all I can say is get them into the car and let them drive the car. I would also add, add another tip, which you should think about as well, which is the notion of if the service bay, if somebody's having their gas car worked on, if you have a BEV as a loaner, give it to them. You probably will be able to sell that car or at least give them, give them an offer of a test drive while they're waiting for the car to be serviced. Another way, again, to really grow revenue in the dealership by cashing in on that enthusiasm. Love it. Really great suggestions, Peter. And now uh, we'll shift to that last piece of the customer journey. Again, we've talked about the shopping for a vehicle the buying or the transacting of an electric vehicle, and now ultimately to the ownership phase, which I kind of prefaced with, is this is such a crucial phase. Uh, and, and again, with new technology and electrification, it's such a crucial phase uh, as a part of the overall customer journey. So we've pretty much talked it and that people love their BEVs. This is an important fact that I want, may want to make sure that you guys all see this. 94% of those folks who did not purchase a Tesla, but did get their BEV, you know, said, hey, the dealership is, you know, I just went to the dealership and it actually is where I was able to finish this business. But let's look at a little bit more detail on how that breaks down. Next slide, please. Now, interestingly enough, um, EV owners trust their dealerships. And now we're getting into the fixed operations or service side. Um, we believe that, you know, there's been some concern in, in service that, you know, revenue streams are going to go down. And of course, there's going to be less um periodic maintenance because of oil change and, and things like that. But at the same time, we honestly believe that retention will go up. Um, we've, we know from other surveys that we do that there's a trust factor here and the trust really comes out in the notion that um, folks who you know, represent the brand, whatever brand it may be, you know, in, at the dealership have that uh, extra training from the factory, have the tools, have the knowledge, have the parts, and so folks that are thinking that have new technology that don't understand the vehicle well enough, they're not going to take it necessarily to a convenience chain or to an independent third party. They're going to bring it to the dealership. So we really believe that, and you can see across the board here between gas, where there's a lot of folks that defect, hybrid, not so much, and then the BEV, most folks, again, are going to go to the dealership for service. We think your retention numbers are going to go way up and you're going to be able to, again, make some of the, up that shortfall in service revenues. Um, what are people doing when they uh, come to the, the dealership? What kind of service are they getting? How do you replace what you may lose? And this is what we found out from the folks who are owning BEVs. What kind of, we asked them, what kind of service are you getting? And you can see 
you know, there's a lot around the new technology, making sure the battery is okay, that the cables are tight, you know, the cooling is good, all these things that are new and different to the power plant that really matter. Because again, nobody wants to be stuck on the side of the road. Um, and there's still some fear around that. So coming in for maintenance in this area, and we think you would, it would be a good idea again to think about these items and maybe create a maintenance package that you can sell again in the F and I uh, desk as a way of giving people comfort that they're going to be taken care of in service. Of course, tires matter a lot. They have more, this car has more torque. They go through tires, they're more heavier. They go through tires more often. So these are what BV owners are seeing today as far as their service. So this is one, and this is where kind of the action comes in. And I think coming out of all of the intelligence that Peter and his team have built and, and all of the all of the recommendations that Peter's done such a tremendous job throughout the session here, it's really talking about what can we do now as an OEM, as a dealer, and certainly uh, CDK and as a technology partner uh, across the entire ecosystem. It's really starting to focus on well, how do we take all of this intelligence and how do we start to enact process? How do we how do we enact uh, things that will make the customer journey even better through shopping, buying, and owning? And really, uh, we boiled it down to these three things. Um, and and I think you know, Peter, I maybe hand it to you here and kind of talk through each one of these uh, from an OEM and a dealer perspective. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I think the most important one, at least for me is knowing your EV strengths and weaknesses. Are you prepared for EV? Um, and again, I mentioned at the very start of this, that this is happening very fast, you know, with the, with the OEMs introducing a lot of models, um, with some of the things going on with legislation, um, certainly the economics of it. Um, so you, I, I really believe you need to be prepared for it if you're not already. And that starts with sales. You know, is your sales team trained to really understand who the customer is and help them? And, and some of the help, by the way, that you need to think about is, you know, how am I going to get my vehicle charged at home? Can you help them, you know, talk about that? And maybe again, the dealership needs to offer a package. Um, what about incentives, be they federal, state, local utility? You know, again, train your sales team to really understand what incentives are out there, because it's honestly, it's a bit of a thicket in understanding, you know, what kind of credits are they going to get? So that's important on the sales side. On the service side, there's a lot really to do. And that is, you know, making sure that you in service that you have EV trained technicians that they understand the safety concerns behind that, that you've brought enough charging power into uh, your service area as well as out to the dealership. Because when vehicles come off the truck, you're going to have to charge those things up before you sell them. Um, so again, power, safety, training, those are uh, key considerations. And then just thinking about your marketing and your messaging, making sure that you have the right messages based on some of the data we're finding. Um, make sure you've set your campaigns up to go after the folks that are EV intenders. The only other thing I want to mention, and real quickly, is again, keep a pulse on those EV adjacent trends, and we're going to help you with that. We're going to do more research in that area. Um, it's a fast moving area. There's a lot of things going on. But one thing I think is clear is once we get past some of the supply constraints, and as the infrastructure is being built out, and as battery prices come down, this is going to take off like a rocket. I mentioned that product adoption uh, curve that we're at, a, we're at the knee of the curve and you're gonna see this thing really go fast. So one thing, I, the last thing I wanna leave you with, and we've done this in other studies, that dealers who lean into change actually do better than those who don't. So again, I encourage you to embrace EV, um, keep, your eyes on, keep your eyes on the, on the target, you'll be fine. Yep, love that. And, and I would add, continue to lean on CDK. Uh, the, the, the amount that we can do to help bring this ecosystem uh, together even closer and, and operate more efficiently is, is continue to leverage uh, the partners that you have as an OEM, that you have as a dealer, uh, and, and absolutely know that CDK is here as a part of that. Uh, we've done such an awesome job with our time here. Uh, absolutely want to say thank you to everybody uh, that's been able to join. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing the partnership uh, with everybody across the entire automotive ecosystem. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.